This is the China in depth. Today is April 4, 2023. This article is from South China Morning Post. China's longest U.S. ambassador vacancy provides latest sign of bleak relations. The article said Beijing has been without an ambassador in Washington for more than three months, the longest period since U.S. China relations normalized in 1979. This reflects the dismal state of the nation's ties and potentially signals a serious rethink of how it engages with the U.S. Evidence that Xie Feng is the choice for the next ambassador was seen when he played a prominent role in meeting U.S. executives on March 24 in Beijing. Diplomatic experts say there is no problem with Xie's agreement, and Beijing has no internal vetting difficulties. The chill has been reciprocal, with the U.S. ambassador to Beijing, Nicholas Burns, facing similar closed doors in his bid to gain access to top Chinese officials. The last time the post remained empty for a lengthy period was in June 1995 when Beijing recalled its ambassador, Li Daoyu, for two months after Washington allowed the Taiwanese president, Li Tinghui, to visit the U.S. in advance of a tense election. China also recognizes that for many U.S. officials, simply meeting with a Chinese ambassador these days is politically problematic, leading to a delay in appointing an ambassador. China is currently undergoing a review of U.S. policy, and is struggling to assess whether Xia can navigate the environment on the ground or whether a fundamental foreign policy shift must be engineered from Beijing. This is compounded by a blizzard of anti-Chinese legislation, a web of encircling military alliances and partnerships, and a U.S. habit of conducting much of its diplomacy in front of cameras. Beijing is concerned that their experienced, high-ranking envoy could face similar treatment in the U.S. capital, undermining the respect China believes it is due. Secretary of State Antony Blinken faced off with Chinese Foreign Affairs Chiefs Wang Yi and Yang Jiechi in Geneva and Alaska, respectively. According to Freeman, this is due to a cultural issue, face. The U.S. supports Taiwan's military defense and international presence, objectives that Beijing opposes. China is frustrated with the U.S.'s lack of response to their attempts to reduce tensions. During the G20 meeting in Indonesia in November, President Xi Jinping and Biden agreed on a plan for ministerial visits, capped by a trip by Xi to San Francisco for the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Summit this November. However, Blinken cancelled his trip due to a Chinese surveillance balloon crossing the U.S., and Xi has yet to make his trip without movement from Washington. Analysts believe the delay may be due to Xi's high-profile trip to Moscow last month and the need for him to sign off on all ministerial-level positions. The U.S.'s lack of an ambassador in Beijing has practical costs, as the envoy serves as the eyes and ears of policymakers back home. Without an ambassador, diplomatic relations cannot improve. China has been engaging in diplomatic activity coming out of the pandemic such as Xi's 12-point peace plan to end the Ukraine war and opening the BRICS grouping to more nations. This article is from Foreign Policy. Shipping lines are getting worried about dependence on China. The article said. Maersk recently took possession of a zero-emission cargo vessel, built by the Jiangsu New Yangtze shipyard in China. Shipping companies are dependent on Chinese shipyards, but the deteriorating relationship between China and the West could cause disruptions. Western countries' shipyards have atrophied and will require significant time and money to restore. China produces the majority of ships in the world, with the UK and Europe producing only 3% in 2010. In the early 1950s, Britain and Western Europe still dominated shipbuilding, but globalization has caused that to shift. Companies are now realizing their dependence on Chinese ports is not ideal, as a conflict over Taiwan could disrupt Chinese shipbuilding. To find alternative shipyards, companies are looking to South Korea and Japan, as both countries are U.S. allies and stable democracies. The U.K. government has announced that it will invest nearly $5 billion to support British shipbuilding and create a task force to make sure future shipyard workers have the right skills. It will take significant investment and time to get shipyards back up and running in Europe and the US. In 1980, workers at the Gdansk shipyard in Poland defied the communist regime and went on strike, forming the Union Solidarnosc. 
This inspired other Poles to voice their unhappiness with the government, leading to the fall of the communist regime in the late 1980s. Globalization brought factories to Poland, but the Gdansk shipyard suffered in competition with Chinese rivals. However, a Danish builder recently acquired it, saving it from potential closure. It would be poetic justice for Gdansk's remaining dock workers if their shipyard were to defy the rule of not just one authoritarian government, but of a second, more powerful one, that of Xi Jinping's China. This article is from Nikkei Asia. New Business, Old Risks for China's Struggling Tutoring Industry The article said, China's after-school education industry was forced to adapt after Beijing rolled out a policy in mid-2021 that outlawed most after-school classes for K-12 students. Companies sought to replace the lost revenue by entering the e-commerce market, selling products such as books and food. Other private education companies started selling items like smart table lamps and e-printers, as well as learning tablets, to deliver coursework without violating the government's restrictions. In the third quarter of 2021, shipments of education-oriented tablets rose 6.9%, ending a streak of declines. For 2021, sales of these tablets grew 3% to 12.9 billion yuan, $5 billion. IDC predicts that China's education-oriented tablet market will grow rapidly over the next few years, with shipments this year growing 7.7% to 3.82 million. Selling tablets and other hardware may not be lucrative enough to replace the revenue that the education companies lost from the education business. Competition in the learning tablet segment is growing, as tech companies are attracted to the artificial intelligence-driven features. Regulators may not look favorably on a pricey education product that could exacerbate the very problem they are trying to solve. Education companies in China were able to shift into device business due to highly developed manufacturing ecosystem. Tablets were launched with higher prices than equivalent products. Education content was packed into devices from companies' years in after-school tutoring industry. Lilishuo believes their product will cater to parents who value education content. Content loaded into learning tablets includes exam prep and other subjects that were barred from classes after the government crackdown. Size of China's K-12 tutoring industry was 168.7 billion yuan in 2020. For Yudao, hardware sales made up 27% of total net revenue in fourth quarter of 2022. For Gautu, hardware sales were not broken out as share of net revenue. Lilishuo was forced to delist from NYSE due to low valuation. Gautu received delisting warning from NYSE in November. The tutoring companies have faced competition in the education hardware segment from the early entrants to the business, such as BBK Education Electronics and Readboy Education Technology. Both founded in the late 1990s, the companies started out selling traditional hardware such as electronic dictionaries before adding learning tablets to their product lineups in recent years. The tutoring companies have justified the high prices of their devices by touting their advanced artificial intelligence AI, features, which has resonated with parents, leading to a 28% increase in sales of Udeo's smart devices. However, the AI features have been overhyped and most of the private tutoring companies remain focused more on shoring up their education content than on AI research and development. The attention has drawn bigger technology companies with a lot more experience with developing AI, such as Alibaba Group Holding, Tencent Holdings, Baidu and ByteDance, into the education hardware business. Over the past three years, the government has turned a blind eye to the development of the education hardware business, but concerns have resurfaced about how pricey instructional products can leave poorer families at a disadvantage, potentially widening the inequality gap. There have been signs that another round of regulatory titan is on the way, such as the Communist Youth League of China adding learning tablets to a list of new types of connected devices that should be restricted for use by minors. The government could tighten regulations on the use of education hardware now that the pandemic is over, and an article written by Yu Weiyu, the head of the Ministry of Education Department charged with overseeing after-school education, has attracted widespread attention. In the article, 
You didn't explicitly mention education hardware but wrote that, after-school instruction is a matter of national security that needs to be tightly regulated. With the end of the strict zero-COVID policy in December, it seems unlikely that schools will again be required to move all classes online again. Thanks for watching and see you all in the next one.